Good afternoon and welcome to Senate Committee on Energy, Economic Development and Tourism. A joint hearing with the Committee on Government Operations, 101 p.m. decision-making agenda. This meeting is being streamed live on YouTube. The measure we're making decisions on is Senate Bill 2765 uh, after careful consideration uh, and conferring with those. My recommendation is to defer this measure indefinitely. Thank you. Yep. And with that meeting adjourned. And we concur. Hello and welcome to the Senate Committee on Energy, Economic Development and Tourism 101 Agenda. This meeting is being streamed live on YouTube. In the unlikely event that we have to abruptly end this hearing due to technical difficulties, the committee will reconvene to discuss any outstanding business at 1 p.m. on Thursday, February 8, 2024 in this room, 229, and a public notice will be posted on the legislature's website. Please note we have a two-minute limit per testifier. First up, Senate Bill 3048, uh, Mr. Tokyo, Director Tokyoka, uh, Deputy, support. Good afternoon, Chair, Vice Chair, members of the committee, Deputy Director Dan Wicker, DBED. Uh, we stand on our testimony in strong support. And Thank available you. Available for questions. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, next up, Randy Leong, testifying for DCCA. Good afternoon, afternoon. Chair DeCoit and uh, Vice Chair Wakai. Um, my name is Randy Leong, um, Cable Television Administrator for the Department of Commerce and Consumer Affairs. Uh, the department is in full support of this bill and would like to note that we defer uh, to DBET and the Hawaii Broadband Office on specific provisions of this bill. Mahalo, and uh, we'll be here for any questions. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next up, uh, State Council on Developmental Disabilities, Daintree, in support, not here. Uh, next up, uh, Kapolei Chamber of Commerce, in support, in person, not here. Uh, next up, Hawaii Broadband Hui, Daniel Smith, on Zoom. Yes, uh, good afternoon, uh, Chair Decoit and um, Vice Chair uh, Wakai and the members of the uh, committee. Uh, the, I'm here speaking on behalf of the Hawaii uh, Broadband Hui. We, we strongly support this bill and uh, believe that its uh, implementation will assist uh, uh, DBED in formulating uh, uh, the procedures for uh, uh, closing the digital equity gap in, um, in, in Hawaii. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Uh, next up, uh, Janice Ikeda in support. Chamber of Commerce of Hawaii in support. We have uh, also late uh, Janine Suki, Point Telecom in support, and IT Reuse Hawaii in support, as well as late testimony from two or six individuals. Anybody else in the room wishing to testify on the measure? Uh, seeing none, any questions? Okay, I got one for uh, debate or broadband. Debate slash broadband. Um, thanks, Dean. So since the bill has no funding, do you guys have a timeline for setting up the grant program? Okay. I'll um, defer that to Chung Chang, Hawaii Broadband Recovery Office. Hello, Chair. Chung Chang, Strategic Broadband Coordinator for DBET. Um, yes, yeah, so we are um, planning to set this up by the time we get the federal funds. Um, so the timing of it will be late third quarter, fourth quarter this year. What month is it? Um, if I had to get October, November-ish. Okay. And then um, how much funding are you guys talking about? Uh, we're anticipating, so right now the notice of funding opportunity hasn't come out yet. We're anticipating that in uh, April of this year. Um, we're anticipating anywhere from 13 to $15 million. Okay, okay. thank you. Okay. Any other questions? 
Okay. Uh, next. Thank you. Next up, uh, Senate Bill three three zero five nine. Link to Stadium Authority. Uh, I'll take Ryan Andrews first. Go ahead. <laughs> Good afternoon, Chair Nicoy, Vice Chair Wakai, and members of the committee. My name is Ryan Andrews. I'm representing the Stadium Authority to uh, voice our strong support for this bill. It's essentially a housekeeping measure uh, that proposes amendments to the Stadium Authority statute aimed at clarifying the requirement to establish a quorum for conducting business and validating acts of the Stadium Authority. Uh, the Stadium Authority comprises of 11 members, nine of whom are voting members and two who are ex officio, non-voting members. However, the current Stadium Authority <laughs> statute lacks specificity regarding the inclusion of non-voting members in establishing a quorum. So the passage of this bill will bring clarity by stipulating that a majority of the currently appointed voting members is necessary to conduct business and that a concurrence of a majority of these voting members is required to take official action. Thank you for the opportunity to testify. I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Uh, next up, DBA Director Dean Wicker. DBA stands in support of the questions. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else wishing to testify on this measure? Seeing none, members, any questions? <coughs> questions? Uh, Stadium Authority. Just got one question for you. Since a, since a bill addresses quorum requirements, has the authority had problems with quorum? The authority has had problems in the last few months with quorum um, because, again, the, the language is not clear, and we have had a new uh, Deputy Attorney General who wanted it clarified. Okay, okay thank you. Uh, next up, Senate Bill 3265 relating to film industry development. Uh, first up, DBIT. Aloha, Chair, members of the committee, Georgia Skinner, Creative Industries Division, DBEN. We stand in strong support of this measure, particularly the components that really help accelerate and move our industry forward. Uh, we appreciate the introduction of the measure. We know that there were some comments by our Deputy Attorney General uh, in relation to the creative, um, the sector regarding Native Hawaiian um, cultural content, et cetera. I just want to pledge to work with the committee and anyone else to see how we can uh, benefit from this. Uh, if it doesn't work in this language, perhaps there's another way to introduce this to support uh, financial support for our local industry. Thank you. Thank you. Next up, uh, Department of Taxation. Wait, comments? Good afternoon, Director. Uh, excuse me, Chair, Vice Chair, and members of the committee. Teresa Zetwick on behalf of the Department of Taxation. We stand on our written testimony offering comments. I'm available for questions. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, next up on Zoom, uh, Attorney General. Sorry. Chair, Vice Chair, members of the committee, Deputy Attorney General Elisa Mia appearing on behalf of the Department of the Attorney General. Uh, we have con constitutional concerns with this bill. First, the provision that exempts Native Hawaiian content from the project cap of seven million could be subject to challenge as violating the First Amendment. You know, this is because the government may not regulate speech based on substantive content, nor can it uh, favor one speaker over another. Uh, additionally, we have concerns with the provisions that, um, that allow for Native Hawaiian staffing and for a subcommittee of Native Hawaiian members. That, those provisions could be subject to challenge uh, for violating the equal protection clauses of the Hawaii State Constitution and of the United States Constitution. Um, that, that's because the government may not treat one race differently than another. So we do have some serious constitutional concerns regarding these provisions, and we are recommending that they be deleted. I'll be available for questions. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next up, University of Hawaii, Chris, Christopher Lee. Afternoon, Chair, Vice Chair, members of the committee. Um, here on behalf of the University of Hawaii, we stand on our testimony in support, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Uh, next up, Oleo Constantino, Field Commissioner from City and County of Honolulu. Uh, 
Honourable Chair, members of the committee, Valeria Constantino, a film commissioner with the Honolulu Film Office, uh, stand on my written testimony in support, and I'm available should you have any questions. Thank you. Uh, also testifying in support, Alani Freitas. Uh, next up, SAG AFTRA in support in person. Hi, good afternoon, Chair and members of the committee. Thank you so much for putting this bill forward and we testify in strong support of it. I've also brought our national board member here to help um, if you have any questions of me or him um, with regards to the actors in Hawaii this, uh, here and our strong support for this bill. I, um, I'm also available for questioning when it comes to if, if you want to chat a little bit more about the First Amendment and constitutional implications of this bill. Um, one of my side gigs, now taking off my sag after hat, is I also teach as an adjunct in both the, both the HPU system and the UH system. And I do teach First Amendment law and um, ethics and communications and communications law. And we can, you know, if we wanted to open that dialogue, I'd be happy to talk with you in the AG's office about other states that have indeed done this kind of thing, maybe not necessarily favoring so much one group over another, but there are Supreme Court cases that do speak to government acting as a patron rather than as a sovereign when it comes to these types of issues. So I welcome the opportunity to discuss further and do whatever we can to support our industry, local hires in the Hawaiian community. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next up, uh, Su uh, Sui Scanlin for uh, the IATSE 665. Aloha Kako, Chair and Vice Chair, members of the committee. Tuiana Scanlon, President, IATSE Local 665 and International Trustee. We stand on our written testimony and support and are available for questions. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, next up, uh, Ohina, Ohina Labs in support, Oi Media in support, Tag Astra in support, Late uh, Henry, uh, Randy Pereira in support, Lucy Hamlin in support. I have a lot of people in support. Um, oh, I know, uh, Tom Yamachika testifying for Foundation Tax Foundation of Hawaii uh, on Zoom. Yes, good afternoon, Chair, members of the committee. This is Jade McMillan on behalf of Tom Yamachika for the Tax Foundation of Hawaii. Uh, we have submitted some comments on this measure and we'll stand on a written comment. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next up, Shireen Ballis. In support on Zoom. Not present on Zoom, Chair. Um, again, we have a lot of people in support. Is there anybody in the room wishing to testify on this measure? See none of uh, Irish. Uh, Chair, Vice Chair, and Committee members, Irish Barber with IATSE. Thank you so much for this measure. Uh, DEI, diversity, equity, and inclusion is super important to the IATSC, and we do have a way to quantify the um 51 percent if it does go forward we have a script supervisor that breaks down every script by page and minutes so if we're once able to identify native hawaiian content we do have someone that works um that can break it down for you thank you thank you anybody else wishing to testify Hello, I'm Becky Stichetti. I'm the executive director for the Hawaii International Film Festival. Uh, we are in support of this bill, um, and that we also do believe that the DEI component is incredibly important to uh, sustain work and the workforce that is present in Hawaii. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, anybody else? Seeing none, members, any questions? Um, Georgia and Kristen. So George, if I'm reading this correctly, the per production cap is going to be lifted to 17 million, isn't it? It's 15 no, million. No, that's the, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, 60 million. So the 50 million five zero cap is in existence now. Uh, we consistently see that our credits coming in are in the 65 to 75 million range. So those roll forward. That's why uh, the 60 million was recommended. The 17 million is the per project cap. So you cannot as an entity by yourself, or your production entity cannot claim more than 17 million. But isn't the current per production cap 15? No, it's 17. 17 million dollars? Yeah, Act 217, uh, SLH 22. Okay. Um, considering 
we have sixty million dollars to play with to help uh, generate all the economic development from film, and to have one entity take seventeen million dollars out of there, shouldn't we be kind of going down the route of having spread the wealth around to as many as possible, rather than having two, th three network films going to take everything and all the, the goodness that we want to do with Native Hawaiian stories and whatever is going to be left on the on the side of the road. Well, I really appreciate the question because it helps me to clarify how we have achieved culling the credit and allocations for the first, the smaller productions. We prioritize them because as a state policy position, it's important for us to grow our own local industry, not just in crew base, which is critically important, but also in our narrative content development. So any production that comes in from 100,000 up to, uh, they're going to be claiming under 500,000, they're prioritized. Uh, normally that comes in right off the top. Okay? The next uh, level is the uh, 2.5 million, anything over that that you're gonna claim, you have to mandatory split, which means you cannot claim 17 million if you're a large production all in one year. That would really devastate the credit and really go against, I think, what the legislature and the administration was trying to achieve initially. So uh, in the, uh, and I'm happy to provide the committee with this breakdown so that it's easy for you to see. Um, but in that manner, we are required by law and the rules to be able to split those. It's critical to um, being fair allocation. Okay, so I want to make sure that everyone gets a piece of the, the pie here. Yeah, um, very important. I want to ask you, Chris, the part about the studio and film facilities part, and I, was it yesterday or the day before we read, we read about, congratulations, Chris, on getting uh, someone to build out the, the film studio in UH West Well, it's the first step. We've been in a public ISP process uh, started, I believe, around June. Uh, submissions were due in October. The committee has been considering the various submissions, and uh, what, we are at the point now where we now have an exclusive negotiation with one entity, which happens to be a uh, local Hui. Okay. So the language in this bill that focus on the film studios and applications and whatnot, is that going to be helpful to your cause or is it you're too um, far down the road so this is really not going to be helpful to you no 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 it's it's very necessary uh this is not this is not an easy lift uh the uh the studio that we're anticipating is going to start at at least a hundred million dollar investment private investment um and uh because it's a lease situation uh, that makes it even more difficult to uh, find funding for projects so the GET exemption on the construction process is something that uh, I'm sure the developers would most welcome. The university doesn't benefit from it itself, but I think it's going to be um, a very important part in the consideration of how they get this project financed. Okay. I mean, I'm, I'm a big fan of film, but when, once mm -hmm. we start carving out like this project doesn't have to pay GET, this project, I, mean, yeah. I can argue that the stadium shouldn't be paying GET as well because of the public benefit. So oh. that's the only thing I find is yeah. just a little slippery slope. If we start doing it for this industry that, yeah. you know, tourism and what a hotel is going to say, I, I shouldn't pay GET. My understanding is we're not the first to um, look, after, look into this. Uh, military housing, I believe, has been exempted from GET uh, taxes for construction. Uh, and, um, you know, it is a consideration, obviously, um, what kind of tax policy you folks want to pursue, but um, I, I do think that this is something that is appreciated. I will also tell you that earlier today we were down at City Hall for the, I forget which reading it was, of Bill 59, um, and this is something that they're following very, very closely. Uh, there is actually in the current bill a requirement that the state uh, include this in order for them to do their property tax exemption. So, um, you know, I, I think this is something that has been used successfully in the past uh, to encourage the kind of development that we want to see and in the islands. And, uh, you know, again, um, it's not, it's, it's going to be a very heavy lift getting, getting this done, but it is something that has the potential to expand the business from the $400 million a year in direct spend that it does to a billion dollars a year. Thank you, Senator Fukunaga. 
I guess in terms of where, you know, the Honolulu City Council has weighed in on this issue, I think mm -hmm. the requirement for a GT exemption was first proposed by the Honolulu City Council. Yes. That the City Council did not want to consider real property tax exemptions unless the state was also going to join in mm -hmm. some form or fashion. So I think it, it um, reflects, you know, a level of partnership mm -hmm. between the state and the county mm -hmm. looking for ways to contribute towards making the development viable. Is that kind of a, mm -hmm. a fair statement of whatever you may have testified to today? <laughs> yes. yes, I think we're at this inflection point where uh, this, uh, at least this body is considering and the governor has in his package something very similar to your to your uh, to your package of incentives, uh, the city for the first time doesn't have a lot of tools in their chest to uh, attract economic development that spurs economic growth and living wage jobs. So, uh, and the university at the same time has been moving forward to develop this land with a private developer with private funds uh, to get us to a point where we have the physical infrastructure so that we're not missing out on half the business, which is what's happening right now since we don't have the stage space. Sure. Thank you. <clears throat> yeah, a couple of things. Um, <clears throat> yeah, because Councilman Kelvin Say said, if uh, the state don't have any skin in the game, uh, we're not going to put nothing in there too. My thing is you talked about um, the military housing and development on the GE tax. Uh, those are mostly federal funds um, coming in to subsidize a lot of the housing. So it's kind of different from this. I understand we want to get the studio built and all that, but we don't want them to take the chicken, the eggs, and the hen house. Mm -hmm. um, not the hen house, the chicken house. Um, all in the same time. You see what I mean? Because we're giving the land, we're giving them a good deal on the land and everything like that. But what we like, I know this is not even on, on this bill, but what is the main um, component of how it's going to really, besides you talking about money, because I can talk about money all day, you know, um, but actual boots on the ground, actual local people, local jobs for local people in the industry. Because I don't like hear later on saying that, oh, we have to have somebody bill them because we never have enough labor. And then it goes out to somebody else. So those are the parameters. I know it was, I never see the RSP going out, but those are the parameters that I gave to the university mm -hmm. to put in because we don't want this to go to anybody that's never put any uh, shovel to the ground when it came to anything with our industry going forward. So I just hope that you guys take that under consideration too. Okay, Chair. Thank you. I'm ready for a vote. So oh, thank, you. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Thank um, you. Just to follow up on um, Senator Wakai's question on the smaller um, productions. productions. So you said it's based on dollar amount? Yes. Yeah, so, so how you call the 50 million each year we prioritize by smaller productions that have come in for the credit. In order to get in for the credit, you have to have a base level of 100,000 of your budget. And then your credit is gonna be either 22 or 27% of that amount. Okay. okay, so it's on a dollar amount. Yeah. But you, you can't do it on um, whether they're local or they're mainland. No. Okay. No, but what I'm saying is that the majority of those that do not claim more than 500,000 in a credit are locally generated productions, whether they're a mid-range production, a small commercial. I get it. Uh, yeah, yes. like that. But, but you cannot distinguish, like the, general, the um, attorney general is saying. Yeah. So what, it doesn't necessarily mean just because it's a smaller amount that it goes to the local production. Correct. But the vast majority, and we can get you metrics on exactly what those are, because we do know. Uh -huh. If you can. Thank you. Thank uh, you. Next up, Senate Bill 3360 relating to renewable fuel. Uh, first up, Department of Taxation. Good afternoon again, Chair, Vice Chair, members of the committee. We stand on our written testimony and comments. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next Thank up, you. Department of <clears throat> Attorney General. Good afternoon, Chair, Vice Chair, Winston Wong, Deputy Attorney General. We submitted written testimony and we have concerns, um, constitutional concerns, um, largely about the locally grown language in the bill. Um, as written, we, we feel that the bill would be subject to challenge right now on constitutional grounds, particularly in regards to a 1984 Supreme Court case of Bacchus Imports 
In that court case, the United States Supreme Court struck down a favorable tax, ex tax exemption from the Hawaii liquor tax um, that related to locally grown food and wine and um, Okolehao specifically. So because of that, we feel that this bill could also be subject to the same challenges and concerns. Um, available for questioning afterwards. Thank you. Next up, Hawaii State Energy Office. Wait, comments? Aloha, Chair, Vice Chairs, and members of the committee. Monique Schaefer on behalf of Mark Glick. Uh, we stand on our written testimony providing comments, and I'm available for questions. Thank, Thank you. you. Next up, Robert King, Biodiesel Technologies, <coughs> support in person. James Forrest, I'm general counsel from Pacific Biodiesel. Well, you, you don't look like Bob. <laughs> <laughs> Banky wishes he looked like him. He's a handsome man. Uh, thank you, Chair, Vice Chair, and Committee members. I am James Forrest. I'm general counsel for Pacific Biodiesel. We create second generation biofuels. That's a locally produced firm energy source. And we're here in support of the bill today. Uh, we do believe that the, in, the increased incentives in the bill demand increased benefits to the state. So we uh, are supporting the two-tiered system. It creates an additional benefits for the locally produced um, feedstock and also for whenever you reach 75% redu reduction in the greenhouse gas emissions. Um, and the locally produced feedstock is very important to this bill. Um, that is part of, the, part of the bill, it was specifically mentioned by Senate President Kochi because it relates to local farming and production of local products, uh, specifically the local fuel, the local uh, feed crops, the feeds the animals. It also provides, uh, we make uh, cooking oil out of this. Um, so we are aware of the Attorney General's, um, uh, I guess, concern about the, the clause. We do believe that that challenge could be overcome. Um, there's really good analysis in the Pono Pacific uh, testimony regarding that legal situation. If you can take a look at that, I do think the case also difference because that was a liquor case. We're talking about renewable fuel. The, the problems associated with uh, that we're trying to solve are energy independence, you know, food security, energy security. Um, we're also amending our soils, soil health, local production of uh, you know, agriculture. So I do think there is a difference that uh, needs to be analyzed. Uh, that local food production is also very important to us. Uh, you'll, you'll see that a lot of the objections to this bill relate to SAF. Um, the bill is not a SAF bill. Uh, there is another bill that's in the Senate. That's SB 2574. That's more of a SAF James, bill. thank you for your time. We have your testimony. Okay, thank you very much. Thank Appreciate you. it. Uh, next up, uh, Mark Inouye testifying on behalf of PAR. Hello, Chair, Vice Chair, members of the committee. Uh, my name is Mark Inouye from PAR Hawaii. I um, appreciate this opportunity to su provide our support and offer amendments on SB 3360. Uh, as you know, Hawaii's landscape is changing, our energy landscape is changing, and as a state, we're making you know, considerable progress in adopting more renewable energy. But it's not, it's not an easy path. One of the exciting you know, areas of Hawaii is the production of renewable fuels right here in the islands. Par Hawaii has already invested 90 million in our Kapolei refinery uh, to start that production of renewable fuels by 2025. We have partners with Hawaiian Airlines, uh, Pono Pacific, and other broad range of stakeholders. And we're committed to um, pursuing this production of locally grown oil seed, seed crops for an alternative to bringing in fossil fuel oils. By summertime next year, the Kapolei refinery slash biorefinery will be able to produce 60 million gallons of renewable fuels for the state. Uh, some of those critical fuels will be sustainable aviation fuel, SAF, and also renewable diesel. Um, they'll both help with our clean energy goals, decarbonization goals for the future. With respect to this measure, uh, we should it should be augmented with the inclusion of the SAF incentive, because if you look at it, many of the, the fuel demands in Hawaii are coming mainly from aviation fuel, and we don't want that to be overlooked. SAF has a, SAF has a higher cost of production 
other than other renewable fuels such as renewable diesel, renewable naphtha. So that's why we strongly feel recommend recommend an additional incentive of one dollar per gallon to bridge that production gap for SAF. This would be significant and meaningful to reach our state's decarb and uh, clean energy goals. We, we again thank you for this opportunity to testify. Uh, support of SB 3360. I'll be here for additional questions. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next up, uh, Alana James testifying on behalf of Hawaiian Airlines. Hi, good afternoon, Chair DeCoy, Vice Chair Wakai, and members of the committee. My name is Alana James. I'm the Managing Director of Sustainability Initiatives at Hawaiian Airlines. We will stand on our written testimony providing comments. But I just wanted to highlight that while we support the intent of Senate Bill 3360, our suggested amendments seek to provide incremental value for sustainable aviation fuel, or SAF, compared to renewable diesel, in order to close the relative margin gap between the two. Without this, producers will not have incentive to produce SAF, which runs the risk of aviation emissions not being addressed with this tax credit. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next up. Jolie Riff, Hawaii Clean Power Task Force, in opposition. Good afternoon, Chair, Vice Chair, members of the committee. My name is Jolie Riff, and I'm here testifying on behalf of the Hawaii Clean Power Task Force in opposition of SB 3360 today. While the notion of promoting locally generated <coughs> renewable fuel appears promising at first glance, our apprehension lies in the definition of renewable feedstocks, which incorporates both biomass and municipal solid waste. Um, it doesn't matter whether it's biofuels or waste-based fuels, burnable fuels are not clean, they are not sustainable, and they are not long-term options. Um, there's an array of experimental incinerator-like incinerator technologies that aim to convert these wastes into fuels, and these processes fall under EPA regulations as municipal waste combustors or waste incinerators. Additionally, when these fuels are burned uh, off-site in vehicles or for air travel, they are not subject to the pollution controls that are applicable for, say, uh, centralized facilities. The only mature technology for aviation biofuels is hydro treating of vegetable oil and animal fats. And this aviation fuel has the potential to create a new market for vegetable oils. Our concern here is that the legislation might unintentionally shift Hawaii's agricultural focus from local food production to renewable fuel production, conflicting with the state's commitment to doubling local food production by 2030 via the Aloha Plus Challenge. Additionally, specific biomass resources in Hawaii and other tropical regions are understudied, lacking the essential information on their performance and behavior undergoing these conversion processes relevant to all alternative jet fuel production. So these burnable fuels labeled as transition options pose economic and infrastructural challenges, uh, hindering a shift to cleaner alternatives. And so the Clean Power Task Force uh, urges reevaluation of the proposed 80 million for subsidizing these renewable fuels and suggest redirecting funds to more efficiently invest in cleaner alternative energy. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next up, Tom Yamachiko, Tax Foundation of Hawaii on Zoom. Yes, good afternoon, Chair, members of the committee. Dave McMillan for Tom Yamachiko, Tax Foundation of Hawaii. We've submitted our comments on the measure and we'll stand on the roof. Thank you. Thank you. Next up, Chris Bennett for Pono Pacific on Zoom. Oh, you on mute. I call up my Aloha Chair Decoy, Vice Chair Wakai, members of the committee. My name is actually Ramsey Brown. I'm here to testify on behalf of Pono Pacific Land Management. I'm the president of Diversified Agriculture. Since 2000, Pono Pacific has worked with landowners in activating working lands and creating sustainable food systems. <clears throat> Given our experience, we've cultivated a partnership with Par Hawaii and Hawaiian Airlines, and we envision an economy where local agriculture, local production of renewable fuel, and local fuel consumption can come together. Pono Pacific is actually actively engaged in crop trials on Oahu with plans to expand to neighbor islands and spur the production of locally grown feedstocks. We believe that the proposed legislation presents a win-win opportunity for our state, our environment, and my sector, our local agricultural sector, by supporting our farmers, fostering clean energy, innovation, and building a more sustainable aviation industry. We believe we can secure a brighter future for generations to come. We stand on our testimony in support of Senate Bill 3360, and I'm happy to answer questions the committee may have. Thank you. 
Thank you. Next up, Energy Justice Network, Mike Ewong uh, in opposition on Zoom. Hello, Chair and Committee members. I'm Mike Ewall with Energy Justice Network and here in support of our work with local groups Kakua and Aina and the Hawaii Clean Power Task Force, standing in opposition to Senate Bill 3360. We're concerned about the costs of this being that there are expensive types of fuels that we're talking about, yet they're not clean and justifying that increased cost by being something that would be advantageous enough to public health and to the environment that is worth spending that sort of money. We are concerned about the fact that we have biotech industry organizations in favor of this and what that might mean for starting to grow genetically modified crops or trees on the island and the whole issue of food versus fuel when the islands don't bring in enough um, well, don't produce enough food without having to import it to have land have to be taken up and deplete soils, deplete water to grow things, to burn them when there are better solutions out there. There are sectors that still need to be cleaned up, particularly the electricity sector, which the state renewable portfolio standard aims to clean up by 2045. And that could be sped up quite a bit. There's a need to ultimately electrify the transportation sector, the electricity sector being cleaner and also electrify the uh, heating sector as well. And rather than wait 22 years to complete that process, this $80 million of subsidies per year could go to these other sectors and have a lot more accomplished for less money in less time than it will take to try to clean up a system of burning from one dirty, going from one dirty fuel, switching to a differently dirty fuel. So I encourage this be redrafted as a study bill to look at the types of alternatives like conservation and efficiency in each of the energy sectors and at basically using wind, solar, and storage for the rest. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next up, uh, Stanley Osterman for Tiger Shark LLC in support, Brian Minamoto for Hawaii Farm Bureau in support, uh, Sean Williams testifying for Airlines for America with comments and testifying for Hawaii uh, trade organization Carl Com Campana with comments. Anybody else in the room wishing to testify on this measure? Seeing none, questions from the committee. Uh, yeah. So I guess the AG. AG, please. So, so we've heard from testimony saying that. You know, there's ways around there's ways around this legality on local local grown and so forth and yeah obviously you know you can fight it in court what does it cost us and how long does it take when when some kind of a challenge is brought forth like this well the last instance that we had was in 1984 with that Bacchus case and it went all the way to the Supreme Court so you're looking at litigation um, probably brought by an out-of-state producer of renewable source fuel that's not beginning the same tax credit um, they would bring that appeal in the tax appeal court here. Um, I don't know, the, the, the amount at stake could be contingent upon the amount of the credit that they're claiming. So um, the costs um, are, are tough to estimate, but it would be a significant amount of resources, especially because um, if they were to bring that type of case, it would be one that would probably be appealed from there to the ICA or the Supreme Court, and then from there also to the Supreme Court. So because it deals with a, a constitutional issue or a United States constitutional issue, um, it, it could be um, pretty significant litigation. So whether we win or lose, it costs the state time and money. Uh, time and win more than this credit possibly. Correct, correct. Um, it would cost the state um, certainly time. Um, I'm, I'm not sure about money at this point because the credit would be would be denied. Um, it's not like the state would be expending the credit and then would have to go to court or fight it in the courts to recover it. So the, the cost of recovering it wouldn't be it wouldn't be like a normal credit where the, the state issues a refund and then has to issue an assessment afterwards. Would you hire outside counsel that was knowledge more knowledgeable than what we might have at the AG? I feel like the state, um, the state solicitor general is, is competent at this point to the, if they were to go to appeal, they'd be competent there. And the tax and charities division has um, a lot of experience specifically with commerce clause issues. So it's, it's one that gets brought up every legislature. We're, we're well briefed on it. 
Well, you know, I know every every legislation we pass is subject to a lawsuit, but when we have um, <clears throat> case law and certain things, I mean, it would be crazy for us to ignore all of that because we could be tied up in the courts. You know, it's easy for private attorneys to say, yeah, well, we can work around it, but once the lawsuit, then we're stuck, right? We're, we're, we don't know how long it's going to take. Certainly, Senator. For us to be involved. Okay, I well, appreciate that. Thank you. Um, and I guess I had a general question. Um, for those that were in opposition, they kept saying alternatives. So possibly the airlines can tell us what are the alternatives other than this and regular fuel that would be affordable. Cleaner alternatives and better solutions, those are the words that were so um, thank you. The, uh, the aviation industry is really focused on aviation sector specific initiatives to decarbonize. That includes things like fleet modernization, sustainable aviation fuel, and operational efficiencies. So airlines are already investing billions of dollars in fleet renewal to um, transition to more efficient uh, airplanes, but really sustainable aviation fuel really sustainable aviation fuel is the most promising technology to help decarbonize aviation. Sustainable aviation fuel has a 50 to 80% lower life cycle emissions compared to conventional jet fuel when measured on a life cycle basis. So it can make really meaningful reductions in uh, aviation emissions. So you're saying that this, this measure could make the reductions, but are there other current so, uh, alternatives out there that's so there are some emerging propulsion technologies like battery electric power or hydrogen power, but those technologies are really only expected to be viable on short haul routes and on smaller vehicles. So here in Hawaii, about 90% of our aviation emissions are associated with our long haul routes, and it's only about 10% on our inner island. Also, our inner island uh, operation is actually really high traffic volume. So we fly 150 flights a day with 128 seat airplanes. And so that type of operation just can't be replaced with significantly smaller vehicles. So those technologies are exciting over the long term, but they will take a long time to develop. Right, and in the meantime, what do we do? In the meantime, sustainable aviation fuel is the most promising technology to really help us address aviation carbon emissions. Okay. Thank you for that. Thank you. So, so just as a follow up, so, um, you guys looking at doing the production here and as well abroad from the mainland where would where would the processing take place is it to one particular processing or are you guys open to other processing areas so for the sustainable aviation fuel so we're the growing, open. The growing of the um, uh, fuel itself so the fuel, um, I mean, sustainable aviation fuel can be used from, be made from a variety of different feedstocks. So feedstock could be imported into Hawaii to produce sustainable aviation fuel, or we could um, grow crop-based feedstock here in the islands to be a source of feedstock for sustainable aviation fuel. So, 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 either, the, amount, so the amount that you guys gonna need to grow, how much would you say would be grown in Hawaii versus grown into, in the mainland? providing those jobs? So I think I would have to defer to um, Ramsey from Plano Pacific on the volumes of the potential for crop-based feedstock here. That would, that would help if we, we could find that out. If, if Ramsey is, is he on Zoom? He was on Zoom. He is on Zoom chair. Can, can you let him in please? Hey. <clears throat> Hello, Chair. Can you hear me? Yep. Okay. Oh, sorry. You can't see. There we go. Uh, yeah, I would have to get back to you. I think Mark Inouye is also in the room. He may have a, a more accurate number uh, there. But uh, we are in current crop trials right now, and we're seeing what kind of a uh, crop would be viable that would work for SAF and also fit well as a rotational crop uh, within our food system so that we could grow food and this biofuel alternate in an alternating fashion. So, so Ramsey, real quick, what, what is the turnover rate on growing this in Hawaii, if you're using them as a bumper crop in relation to the food that you're growing? This is a 100-day crop that we're growing. It's about three months. 
and our vegetable crops are anywhere from 30 days to 90 days and then we'll let the rest the field rest so we'll basically do let's say 90 days of carrots and then we'll do 100 days of this cover crop that could be used as sustainable aviation fuel and then back into carrots and our root vegetables what is the rate per acre on the uh, biofuel how, how much production the, would you do on an acre for our uh, biofuel the yield yes uh, i'll have to look up that number chair and get back to you on that i'll make a note of it here okay if you can please thank you yep you want to go in position Good. Any other question? Oh, Senator Walker. Uh, the gentleman from PAR. I like uh, biofuels and renewables, um, but this bill has some big numbers in it. I mean, you're going from a $20 million tax credit to an $80 million tax credit. Right now, the cap is at $3.5 million. Do you already, does PAR already take three and a half million dollars in tax credits? Not for this bill. No, we, not because we don't do any renewable fuels right now. We, we're getting ready to do renewable fuels for next year and we can start producing, but not at this moment. Okay, and then I see it seems like a very convoluted kind of a, a way to avail yourself to the tax credit. You get 75% of the total tax credits. Then there's a dollar added per gallon of renewable fuels. Let's say we let's we go with it. It's eighty million dollars. This will allow seventy-five million for one project. So PAR could get sixty million out of the eighty million dollars. Correct? I mean, possibly. That, that's a lot of money for us to give to one corporation in in Hawaii. Um, and to Senator Decoy's question about like you don't even know what our local agriculture input would be to this because part of me thinks like i don't want part of this 80 million dollars to go sure. to costa rica or wherever it is going to create the ethanol or whatever the biofuel is is so shouldn't we have a clear understanding of where is hawaii's taxpayers money is going if it's going to help agriculture well that's an added benefit but if it's going to go help some southeast asian country uh, create an industry there then i don't think that's a very wise use of state taxpayers money yeah and that's not not our intention really is to we're finding this out now we're working with pono pacific work working with the you know private sector as well with hawaiian airlines and you know going through this process is is learning right um it's it's going to be a it's, this is what the trials is all about for us, is to find out all this, how much, you know, yield can we get for a, a acre, you know, through growing our biofuels out there through different locations. I mean, every location is going to be different. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned that most of these credits would go for sustainable aviation fuel. Considering most of that is paid for by a tourist, isn't it smarter for us to allow the tourists to pay for that rather than all of us pay for that? Subsidy to you? I, I wouldn't... Uh, I don't want to answer that question, but I, I think, you know, it's both sustain, sustainable aviation fuel and also renewable diesel. I think that's going to be where we can also fit in. And that's for utility, um, also for transportation, marine, um, heavy duty, heavy duty trucks as well. So it's, it's going to be a mix in that mm -hmm. sense. Yes, yeah, so I understand that, that there are going to be multiple off takers, but mm -hmm. you mentioned in your testimony, that the vast majority of this is going to go for sustainable aviation fuel, which is right now paid for mainly by tourists. Mm -hmm. So what we're doing here is shifting the, the, the push for sustainable and renewable energy off of tourists and putting it on locals to pay for that. Mm -hmm. Is that a wise decision? I, I really wouldn't want to, I guess, comment on that one. But I mean, what, you, what you're saying kind of makes sense. I think it makes a lot of sense. Thank you. Thank you. Sure. Senator So majority of them is for aviation fuel, and then you said yes. Sit on us. Sorry. Sorry, I don't know your name this so just can sit down. Anyway, so you said diesel, a biodiesel, and uh, um, aviation fuel. So how is this going to benefit as we're going towards renewable energy and having almost all the diesel uh, equipment go to <clears throat> electric? How, how is this going to be viable uh, when the biodiesel and all of that is starting to be less and less used? <clears throat> how is that going to um, help our taxpayers going forward? Yeah, I, I believe that, you know, with biodiesel, right now I think they're in production with 5.5 5 .5 million 
uh, gallons per year. And that's, you know, I, I don't know what percentage that is of, you know, offtake to HECO and KIUC and others, but we're, you know, planning to expand that rate to uh, 60 million, which, you know, give or take is SAF and RRD, renewable diesel. Um, so it's gonna help, I guess, in different ways. It has, it has to. So I, I never catch what Senator, uh... Like I said, but how much individual taxpayers will benefit, and how many um, more taxpayers could benefit from this increased 80 million available tax credit per calendar year? Uh, I mean, that's open for PAR, Pacific Biodiesel, or just spurring the innovation of other companies to get in, involved. So, just going forward, Chair, um, <clears throat> I don't know if you've been around, and I don't know if the energy guy is paying attention. But, you know, we've been advocating for hemp industry, uh, hemp products moving forward with hemp. And we're looking at all of this money that we're looking into. How much of that, I mean, besides what you guys looking with the biodiesel and uh, aviation fuel that you guys can start come with agriculture coming in with the uh, uh, hemp products? Because you can harvest three times a year uh, with, with if you're using hemp for fuel. Mm -hmm. And maybe more depending on the climate. And Hawaii is a diverse uh, area for uh, that kind of growing. So, did you guys even look into that? The partners of Pono Pacific, are, I believe, are evaluating different types of crops, you know, growing not just camelina, but looking at other crops as well here in Hawaii. And they would be the ones to, uh, to evaluate that one with him. Yeah, so you know how much um, money that we got, the state got from Monsanto and their corn that there was growing in my community. Every single grain went to the continent. Nothing stayed here. Mm. They use their land. They get the tax breaks as farmers. All of this great stuff, but zero, I don't think zero, but I'm making them all yeah, numbers. Yeah, yeah. Zero benefits to the taxpayer because they take that corn and they sell it someplace else for fuel or uh, feed, and we make nothing. We're giving them the land. We're giving them the water. Of course, we make a few dollars here and there on the taxes, but on the benefit of the crop, zero. So that's the kind of stuff that we're talking about here. So is there any way that you can, if you guys go do something viable, make sure the taxpayers here have a benefit thing for over 75% that we get something back. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Any other <clears throat> questions? Seeing none, uh, reasons for decision making. We're ready for decision making on our 101 p.m. agenda. You guys keep the noise down. Yeah. Can you talk hey. outside? Can you just keep the noise down, please? Okay. Um, decision making on our 101 p.m. agenda. First bill on the agenda is Senate Bill 3048 relating to the Hawaii Broadband and Digital Equity Office. Recommendation is to pass as an SD1 making technical amendments needed for consistency and clarity and defecting the date to January 1st, 2060. Committee members, any discussion? Seeing none, Chair Wakai for the vote. Chair votes aye. Vice Chair votes yes. Senator Fukunaga. Aye. Senator Kim. Aye. Senator Favela. Aye. Chair, your recommendation is adopted. Thank you. Next bill up, Senate Bill 3059, reading to the Stadium Authority. Recommendation is to pass as an SD1. In subsection, subsection B on page seven, line two, adding the word voting before members to clarify that voting members of the board will be electing the board chair on page seven, lines 15 and 18, change currently appointed to currently serving members regarding the quorum requirements, making technical amendments needed for consistency and clarity, defecting the date to January 1st, 2060. Committee members, any discussion? Seeing none. Uh, chair votes aye. Chair Wakai for the vote. Noting the presence of all members, any opposition or reservation to the chair's recommendation? Having seen and heard none, chair, your recommendation is adopted. Thank you. Next bill, uh, Senate Bill 3265, relating to the film industry development. I appreciate all the testimonies submitted on this measure. 
My recommendation is to pass as an SD1 incorporating the AG's suggested amendments regarding the constitutionality regarding the Native Hawaiian content provisions. So on, we will be deleting the exemption to the per project cap for Native Hawaiian content and staffing on page 8, lines 12 to 16, and the definition of Native Hawaiian, Native Hawaiian content on page 9, lines 12 to 15. Also deleting section 201-E on page 3, lines 11 to 15, concerning the subcommittee of the Hawaii Film Advisory Council, which is both a membership and mandate that is subject to constitutional challenge. Also incorporating the DOTAC suggested amendments on the dates making the, the fourth section two effective January 1st, 2025, and section three applies to expenditures made after December 31st, 2024. I'd like to note in the committee report, the testimony in support of the Native Hawaiian content provisions and advisory board subcommittee and would like to explore options with the attorney general's office as to how to reach the goal for advising on cultural content within constitutional bounds to either incorporate into a senate concurrent resolution or possible legislation committee members any discussion can i ask chris lee? chris lee is he chris lee no, can you come up with ask, ask, ask one question Okay, just one. Just one. One quick one. <clears throat> Do you think we need to have the New Zealand film industry on this um, film advisory council? Uh, um, Senator Vavilla, what I'm going to do is I'm going to move it down and then oh, okay. we can have the next committee deal oh, with yeah. the adding or deleting, okay. if that's okay with you. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Chair Wakai for the vote. Chair votes aye. Uh, noting the mem membership of uh, everyone here on the committee. Any opposition or, or reservation to the chair's recommendation? We pass this measure with amendments. Having seen and heard none, chair, your recommendation is adopted. Thank you. Final bill on the agenda, Senate Bill 3360 relating to renewable fuel. My recommendation is to pass as an SD1, blanking out the sunset date, blanking out the tax credit amount, defecting the date to January 1st, 2060. Noting in the committee report, the next committee to consider how far to extend the sunset date and the feasible money amount for the tax credit. Committee members, any discussion? Seeing none, West Shore Kai for the vote, Chair votes aye. Noting the presence of all members, any opposition or reservations to the Chair's recommendation, we pass this measure with amendments. <coughs> Having seen and heard none, Chair, your recommendation is adopted. Thank you, and with that, we are adjourned. Mahalo for being here today. Hello and Can welcome you keep to the, the door closed. Aloha and welcome to the Senate Excuse me. Committee yeah. on Energy, Economic Development, Tourism, 2 p.m. hearing. We have one GM on this agenda. This meeting is being streamed live on YouTube in the likely event that we have to abruptly end this hearing due to technical difficulties. The committee will reconvene to discuss any outstanding businesses at 1 p.m. on Thursday, February 8, 2024, in this room, 2 to 9, and a public notice will be posted on the legislature website. Please note we have a one minute for testifier. Sorry, you guys got a lot of testifiers. Um, and you are uh, able to stand on your testimony in support. Um, our GM nominee is GM 595, submitting for consideration and confirmation as a director of the Depart Department of Business, Economic Development, and Tourism. Gubernatorial nominee, James Kunani Tokioka, for a term to expire 12-31-2026. First up, Governor Josh Green in support, in person. I guess he's not here. He's answering the phones. Yeah, um, he's the next up, uh, Mark Glick for State Energy Office in support, in person. He's answering the other phones. Uh, well, actually, I'm here on okay. Zoom. Okay, go ahead. Um, I just want to, uh, my I stand by my testimony in strong support of this. Um, but I also just want to point out how uh, wonderful it is that we actually have this confluence of someone with such long-standing public service and, you know, the business abilities and uh, and private sector experience that uh, James Kanani uh, Tokioka has, and I'm very excited to to support um, 
him as DBED director in this nomination. Encourage your um, approval. Thank you. Thank you. Next up, Dennis Ling, the uh, Department of Business Development and Support Division in person in support. Uh, next, Department of Labor Industrial Relations, Director Jay Boutet. Aloha and good afternoon, uh, Jerdy Coit, uh, Vice Chair Wakai, and honorable members of the committee. Uh, I'm Jade Butai, uh, Director of the Department of Labor and Industrial Relations. On behalf of uh, DLIR, and especially on my own behalf, uh, I strongly stand on a testimony in support. Um, you know, I have the joy and privilege uh, of working uh, closely with uh, Mr. Tokioko when he was in the legislature and during the the response and recovery for the Maui wildfires. Uh, you know, we have many of our employees who were had to staff the various uh, disaster centers and resource centers to provide uh, unemployment insurance and uh, work search assistance. And he skillfully managed the uh, you know their hotel accommodations. Uh, I have witnessed his dedication uh, to serving those in need and look favorably upon his commitment and service to the people of Hawaii. Uh, I humbly request this committee to confirm him. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next up, uh, David Sink, uh, Foreign Trade uh, in support. Uh, next up, Tian, Eugene Tian, uh, Research and Economic Division in support. Next, Luis Salavaria, Department of Budget and Finance, oh, in support. If I just may say a few words, I stand on our written, my written testimony in strong support of uh, Jimmy for the position of the DBED director. Uh, and as a former member of that very small club myself, I can, I can honestly tell you, it's been an amazing opportunity to be able to work with Jimmy as the DBED director. I think he's done an exceptional job. And what he's been able to do over the last several months that he's been in, in the position, really, uh, I couldn't imagine anybody else doing that well of a job that he did. But thank you. Thank you. Are you do you want me to speak on everybody's behalf right now? Because there's like a long list okay. of people. <laughs> is everybody all in agreement with what uh, Mr. Salavar is saying? Might not get to him. If yeah. We... Okay. So next up, um, Chung Chang uh, in support on behalf of Broadband. Thank you. Uh, next up, Don Chang in support uh, on behalf of Dilanar. Thank you. Uh, Nadine Ando, Director of DCCA, also in support. Thank you. Good afternoon. I'm here. Oh, I'm Thank you, Nadine. Uh, Wayne Yamamoto Lao, Yamamoto Lao, Hawaii Green Infrastructure Authority, also in support. Yes, in support. Thanks, Wayne. Uh, Dean Hazama, Deputy Director, Department of Commerce and Consumer. Affairs also in support in person someplace. Uh, Hakeem Owansafi, Public Housing Authority also in support and here in person. Hello. Thank you. Uh, aloha. Uh, aloha. Very well. Uh, we stand in strong support, but I just wanted to share a, a very small thing. When I called Jimmy, I thought he was still with Department uh, uh, of DOT about a matter has to do with HPHA. By then, he was at DBED. Not only he just didn't direct me back there, but he went on and did the research and got back to the housing authority on something that has nothing to do with his department. That's the kind of uh, the quality of person that he is. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Uh, next up, Wendy Gady on behalf of ADC. Good afternoon, Chair, Vice Chair, members of the committee. ADC stands, and I stand personally, in strong support of Director Tokioka. I have the privilege of seeing how he works in his community in Kauai, the support, the respect, and the long-time journey of supporting agribusiness across the state is much appreciated, strongly support. Thank you. Next up, uh, Dean Minakami, behalf of Hawaii Housing Finance and Development Corporation in support. Sharon Hurd, in oh, oh, wait, right hang, hang on. Okay, let me get oh, Dean first. Hi, Dean. Thank you, Chair, Vice Chair, members. Strong, stand, so strong support for Jimmy. I had the chance to work with Jimmy shortly after the fires. Uh, we worked together in the convention center. I was there for about a month. Jimmy was there much longer. I saw the leadership he provides. 
uh, his character. It's the reason why the survivors got out of shelters into hotels was because of Jimmy's leadership. He set that path before FEMA got here, before Red Cross got here. So it really was his leadership that was the deciding factor. And as a leader of DBED, he's just been outstanding, encouraged collaboration among the departments, among the agencies, so we can leverage our resources to support each other and, and other departments. So as, express strong support for Jimmy as the uh, director of DBED. Thank you. Thank you. Next up, uh, Director Hurd from Department of Agriculture. Chair, Vice Chair, members of the committee, Sharon Hurd, Department of Agriculture, stand on my written testimony in support of Jimmy Tukin. Thank you. Next up, Georgia Skinner on behalf of Creative Industries. In strong support of this Thank you. Thank you. Next up, Tommy Johnson, Director of the Department of Corrections and Rehabilitation, also in support. Uh, Hawaii Technology Development Corporation in support. Thank you. Uh, next up, Daniel Nahopi, testifying for Hawaii Tourism Authority. Hawaii Tourism Authority stands on the support of Thank you. Uh, next up, Sabrina Nasir, Department of Budget and Finance. Strong support. Thank you. Thank you. Next up, Stacey Ferreira, testifying for Office of Hawaiian Affairs. Aloha, strong support for Thank you. Uh, next up, Kali Watson, Department of Hawaiian Homelands, also in support. Uh, Hawaii Farm Bureau. Oh, go ahead. On behalf of the UHL, Kelly and myself, in strong support. Thank Th you. Thank you. Uh, next up, Brian Miyamoto, Hawaii Farm Bureau, also in support. Uh, Unite Hawaii here, Local 5, also in support. Yep. Hi, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, my name is Jolie Tokusatu with Unite Here Local 5. As an organization, we have known Mr. Tokioka for many years now. And in that time, we have observed firsthand his steadfast commitment towards defending the public's interest. As a former state legislator, airports division director, and hospitality industry leader, we know that Mr. Tokioka brings with him a wealth of knowledge and experience to the department. In fact, Mr. Tokioka has already proven himself to be a valuable leader to our state. His leadership in coordinating the state's response to the housing displaced Maui wildfire victims is also worth noting. Our organization is confident that Mr. Tokioka, if confirmed, will continue to serve in our community's best interest and utilize his diverse set of experiences and subject matter expertise to help stabilize Hawaii's tourism industry in lieu of the many challenges we currently face. So thank you for letting us testify. Thank, thank you. Next up, Deputy Director Dean Ripper for DBIT. Thank you. Next up, Clyde Hayashi. Also in support. Thank you. Uh, Maria Pasquale, also in support. Good afternoon, Chair, Vice Chair, and members of the committee. My name is Lucy Pasquale, and I'm in strong support of GM number 595. Having been the ASO of the Department of Business and Economic Development since last year, I can say that Jimmy Toki Oka is a passionate leader. He is truly clear about carrying out the department's vision and mission. Mr. Toki Oka effectively delegates tasks to managers and staff, identifying employees and their unique talents and skills. As a result, the duties delegated are done effectively by the managers and assigned staff. Furthermore, he brings a valuable element of camaraderie to the team, characterized by a sense of humor that may not be immediately trans apparent given his position at the director level. <laughs> In closing, I strongly urge his confirmation as DBED director for this and other reasons. Thank, Thank you. you. Didn't you say Tokyo can write that for you? I'm sorry. <laughs> Thank you. Promotion. Thank you. Uh, next up, next up uh, Dr. Fink in support. Uh, Brian Yaman. Oh. We'll stand on our, I'll stand on my testimony for support. Thank you. Next up, next up, Ryan Yamani, also in support. Oh no. Oh, no. <laughs> oh, no. 60 seconds. Eh? No. Um, you got only 15. Oh, okay. Thanks, Chair, Vice Chair, and members. Uh, speaking on behalf of Ryan Yamani, not as uh, a deputy, just wanted to say to highlight the fact that, that I did see um, Mr. Tokyoka, acting director, work very hard during the Maui fires. I was quite impressed. Um, 
of his dedication and commitment to work with the various stakeholders. Just want to highlight to the chair that um, he had 16 years of not being a chair in the house, so he's well rested and ready to take over. <laughs> Who needs enemies? Mary Alice Evans, also. In, thank you, Mary Alice. Rachel Wong in support. Oh, thank you, Rachel. Uh, Craig Nakamoto. Stand his strong support. Thank you. Uh, Sanhai Government Strategies in support. Um, Jordan Lo, Director of Law Enforcement. Yeah, please stand by our written testimony and strong support. Thank you. Ryan Andrews, <coughs> State of Authority. Yep, stand in support. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Director Sniffin, Department of Transportation, also in support. Uh, Daniel Ordendecker, LUC, also in support. Keith Hayashi, testifying Hawaii State Department of Education. Thank you. Uh, Ken Hara, uh, Department of Defense, also in support. Gary Suganuma, Department of Taxation and Support. Kristen Sakamoto, Department of Taxation and Support. James Barrows, Emergency Management. So I got a lot of um, <laughs> people in support. Um, in person, Brenna Hashimoto, Department of Human Services not here, uh, in support, uh, many others. Um, Jesus Christ, so did you just pay all these guys? No. Um, <laughs> but there's a lot of you guys in support, but I have the Lieutenant Governor here. I, I figured this gotta be opposition. So please, 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 you gotta be one. Have a seat, Lieutenant Governor. Good afternoon, Chair and the members of the committee. Um, you know, uh, I apologize, I didn't submit testimony, but I'm just gonna be very short. Uh, you know, during the Maui fires, there were um, people who stepped up uh, and Jimmy Tokioka is one of those people that who stepped up. I called him at around 1130, as you know, during the Maui fires, I was acting up. And the way that he quickly worked with HTA, the members of the industry working with Maui County, it's something that, you know, I just felt that I usually don't come to testify for a confirmation because, you know, I believe that there should be, this is your latitude and this is your time, but I felt obligated to come and testify because a lot of times, even in your roles, um, we never want to be in a situation where you know we saw devastation like that but uh you know the fact that jimmy and um he was able to showcase his skills and his relationship and the things he did and he didn't sleep until the governor landed the next day for him to have done everything that he did i felt i had to you know be here to testify in support. But you know, if I had known that everybody else was gonna be testifying in support, you know, I wouldn't have come. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> now, can you tell us when he was in the house though? <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah, so that's the other thing, you know, I mean, in the house, you know, he and I barely got along. So it, it somewhat pains me to be <laughs> sitting here to be testifying in just, admiration and support, but this is what happens, you know? I mean, you never know. And when situation comes up, people rise to the occasion, and I'm just very proud of him as not just DIVA director, but as part of the administration. So, mahalo for your time. Thank you, Lieutenant Governor. Thank you. I guess as Mr. Yamani said, he was sleeping all that time, so. Um, is there anybody else wishing to testify in support? We want to follow her. We have Hawaii Teachers, Local 996, we're in instruction. Thank you. Anybody else outside wanting to testify on behalf of uh, Mr. Tokioka? Thank you. I apologize for not having a written uh, recommendation, but I just wanted to um, echo Lieutenant Governor's words. Um, uh, my name is Chris West. I'm the president of Local 142 ILW. And uh, in the recent um, tragedy of the wildfires in Maui. We had 2,800 members that lived there. Um, and out of the 2,800, sorry, not lived there, that worked there, out of the 2,800, 1,500 um, resided and um, were homeless. And um, even though it was outside of Jimmy's scope of work, um, Mr. Tokyo's work, um, he was a huge, huge impact um, 
in um, mitigating a lot of um, our members and the problems that they um, uh, were seeing because of the fires. And I wanted to make sure that I came down personally to, to testify in support of him, but also to thank him. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, seeing nobody else like opposed this, but Mr. Tokioka, if you'd like to uh, give us a Thank you. Thank you, Senator Decoy. Do you need some Kleenex? You know, oddly enough, Dean Minakami was the one who kind of made me oh, get tears. Thank you, Dean. <laughs> uh, Vice Chair Makai, members of the committee, thank you for this incredible, incredible honor to be sitting in front of you today. <clears throat> I'd like to thank uh, Governor Green and the Chief of Staff, Chief of Staff Brooke Wilson, for appointing me to this very important department and your trust that I would be able to achieve the visions and the goal that the Green Administration set forth. I'm honored. I'd like to thank uh, you, uh, Chair DeCoit and Senate President, for putting this item on the agenda as quickly as you did, because I know that it could have been, you know, spread uh, spread out and pushed back. Uh, Senator Kim had her way. <laughs> <laughs> so I appreciate uh, you folks moving this up. So thank you for that. It's a huge honor. Um, on the personal note, um, I have a son, Pono, which most of you know. My daughter, Emma, Pono's 28, Emma's 24. My mom, who's 88, is still living, and she's probably watching. My sister probably had her set up on her television at home, so hi, Mom. Uh, my sister, Donna, and my brother, Tommy. Um, our team, I'd like to thank our team, because I'm one of the fortunate directors that instead of coming to you in a, um, after an election year when all the departments and directors are new and you don't know um, the people that they're working with and how they're going to work with those people. I had the opportunity to do that for the last um, seven months. So um, I'm very, very fortunate as in the Senate, you know, uh, Deputy Director Dane Wicker. Um, all of these things that people talked about that happened during the fire, I would not have been able to do if it was not for Dane Wicker taking over the day to day operations of DBED. And, um, garnering the support of all of the division agencies. Uh, there was no, um, it was seamless. Dane just took over after I told him that with what the governor was asking me to do, it would be almost impossible for me to do both. And Dane stepped up to the challenge and really did a great job and I cannot thank him enough. Um, the other person that I'm gonna give a special appreciation for is Don Murata. I don't think she's here, she might be outside. But um, Don um, and Keith Regan, I got to thank them because uh, there was uncertainty what was going to happen at the airport before I got there. So Don left the airport after 20, 24 years, I believe, and she went to go work for Keith Regan. Um, when I went to the airport after she had already left, um, there were some people, um, one of our friends, West Yonami being one of them, that called Don and asked Don if she could go back to the airport to help assist me in the many challenges were, that were there. And there were many. And so Don left as a director's um, administ administrative assistant to go back and work at the airport for me. Um, and I had never even met her. Uh, so I thank her for, um, for doing that. And when I left the airport and went to DBED, she came along with me. So she's been a big part of our team. Um, uh, Kellyanne Yamamoto, who's uh, Dane Worker's administrative assistant, Lacey Goshi and Margaret Liu, had it not for, been for all of them during the fire, it just wouldn't have happened because they were on it every single day. Um, there was a time where people here that are here from HTA and our office stayed at the convention center for 24 hours straight. And some, in fact, sometimes more than that because the um, shelter at the convention center that was supposed to take in survivors that didn't possibly have flights to go back to the mainland and or didn't have accommodations here was set up. And we, we anticipated that there would be about 1,000 to 1,500 people that were going to show up there. They, were, they didn't come in those numbers, but we were ready for them. And I need to thank um, a lot of people who were there during that time. Um, some of them are back here. Daniel Naho P.E., uh, Ilihia Gaisan. Isaac Choi, they as well were in the room 
for you know 24 hours at, in, in the beginning. Um, I will talk about some of the others that we need to thank there, but I also want to thank the agencies from uh, the comments and letters of support for my nomination. Um, I, I, I personally didn't ask the agencies to send in testimony, but they're here, and I'm very, very proud um, to say that I work, we work together. So from ADC, Wendy Gady, <coughs> BD, SD, Dennis Ling, FTZ, David Shinkik, HCDA, Craig Nakamoto, HHFDC, Dean Minakami, HTA, Daniel Noho, PE, LUC, Daniel Orendecker, OPSD, Mary Alice Evans, SA, Ryan Andrews, ASO, uh, Lucy Pasquale, CID, Georgia Skinner, HB, DEO, Chung Chang, HGIA, Gwen Lau, Yamamoto Lau, S HSEO, Mark Glick, uh, HTDC, Wayne Inouye, Nelha, uh, Greg Barber, Reed, Dr. Dian, and SBRRB, Dory Pavlicek. Um, <clears throat> I, I know this is it's taking some time, but I just want to thank them because they, uh, during all of this time, has been uh, very accommodating. And I know that um, it's a different management style that uh, Deputy Wicker and I have, but they have been very um, eager and willing to, to change how they did operations. And, you know, we're not micromanagers, but we expect a lot of them. And a lot of what we've told them is you're going to expect a lot from us. And I think Dana and I have a, a keen understanding of what happens in committee hearings. And if um, they're not prepared for it and we're not prepared for it, we're going to look bad. And a lot of um, what has happened in the past with other departments that come and testify and don't have their information or tell you guys things that are not true or accurate. We want to, we have uh, instilled that culture that whatever it is, we got to make sure that we, they understand that the legislature is the bank. What we get in funding comes from you folks. So we need to earn it. And we try to do that in every single thing that we do at, at the event. <clears throat> so <clears throat> this is the hardest part about me is talking about myself, <laughs> but I think it's important that I share some of it, um, my public service. Um, I've had the opportunity to serve on the Kauai County Council for 10 years, um, in the House of Representatives for 16 years, um, as the Deputy Director at Hawaii State Department of Transportation Airports. I've been the Interim Director since May 5th uh, at DBED. Uh, prior to that, I, uh, I worked in the hospitality in industry and for 24 years. Um, I, I worked in Hawaii and all across the United States managing um, hotels and restaurants for uh, Holiday Inn Corporation. I was in um, San Francisco in 1989. I was the general manager of a hotel when the earthquake hit. Uh, and I had to manage that emergency situation. So it helped prepare me for part of this. Uh, been through Iniki as well on Kauai. In addition, I spent 12 years working with <coughs> Oceanic Time Warner Cable. Spectrum, I, I oversaw new business accounts um, throughout the state. Uh, the biggest contract that was signed in the company's history, I secured uh, when I, while I was working there. Uh, since my nomination as the DBID director on May 5th, I've been deeply involved in the wildfire, wildfire response efforts. And you know, there was a lot of people that talked about that, so I won't talk about a lot of what we wrote, but um, Red Cross has said that uh, in any disaster nationwide that they've experienced, um, they have never seen uh, survivors move from um, emergency tent shelters to hotels or congregate shelters, non-congregate shelters, in the short span of 13 days, moving 5,000 people. So that, that could not have been done with um, a lot of help from a lot of people, and so, I will start with the governor's office. Um, Luke Myers and Craig uh, Collette was um, there with me as the co-chairs of this temporary housing sheltering program. Haima, um, and I, I don't want to go through the names because I'm going to miss some of them. Uh, but the American Red Cross came, you know, five days after the fire started, in our communication room at the convention center. FEMA later on came. SBA was there. HUD was there. Of course, HTA, as I mentioned, um, and uh, one of the agencies that gets 
a little overlooked was the Hawaii Convention Center. Terry and her team did an incredible, incredible job <coughs> staffing the, the convention center. Um, as Dean spoke about the Hawaii Fire Relief Program, uh, he popped up that program in a very short period of time where we got 600 families to move into uh, vacation rentals, um, single family vacation rentals, 600 of them in a short period of time. Since then, we've turned that prog program over to CNHA. So Kuhio Lewis and his team are managing that program now. But every day was the Office of uh, Planning and Sustainability. The Reed office was in that communication room every day trying to make sure that whatever we could do to communicate to the survivors and um, the media so that they could get that information out is, is what we took pride in. And it was a big, heavy, heavy lift. And some community partners I'd like to thank because uh, they were there every day, every morning um, on Zoom, helping us coordinate. And that would be Jerry Gibson from the Hawaii Hotel Alliance, Jeff Wagner from Outrigger Hotels, Lisa Paulson from the Maui Hotel and Lodging Association, and Kelly Sanders and his team from the Royal Lahaina Hotel. You know, without their support and not, without them being on the call seven days a week, all of what happened wouldn't have been able to happen. <clears throat> um, one of the things that we're working on now with Maui County is the Economic Recovery Commission. Thank you, Senator Coit, for being a member and for being there. But you can see in, um, in this commission the, the people that are on it, and many of them um, sent in testimony. Some of them are here. But what this, this commission is going to be set up to do that the governor appointed me to, to convene is to get outreach into the communities from cultural specialists, from industry, from hotel workers, from the unions, from the, the trade unions, because there's going to be a lot of um, workforce development that needs to be trained uh, going forward in Maui, because construction will be a long-term commitment. And so the trade unions are a big part of it. <clears throat> um, I can go into some of the questions that you asked me in my um, thing. We, we have but, your answers for that. Okay. <laughs> I was hoping oh, oh, you were oh, going to oh, say oh, that. Only because oh, we got a hard stop. And for, for the committee members that didn't get it, I had the email sent to you folks on the questionnaire that was answered. And, and, and uh, you know, uh, in our info briefing at um, WAM, a lot of the things that we are, I mean, this is talking about specifically DBED now, are the same things that I was going to mention in this uh, presentation. So, you know, moving the needle forward, getting from the cradle to grave, and uh, schools connected with the universities, workforce development, the film unions, and trades. Uh, so um, I can stop now if you wish, and then be ready, prepared to answer questions. Yeah, you know, we, we have your resume as well as your um, questionnaire. And by the amount of people that are behind you and the testifiers of 101 people, mind you, today is the sixth month of the anniversary of the fire, which says a lot. But I will allow the community, if, allow the community to. Yeah, I forgot <clears throat> on the personal note because I wrote over it over okay. Christine, I think she's outside. I wanted to thank her as well. I did thank my son. I, and I my don't daughter. think she heard you. Can, can you say that? <laughs> <laughs> Christine, are you listening? Thank you. <laughs> no, any, you anything else? If not, no. No, I will allow for the community thank to ask. Thank you, Mr. Tokyoka. Any questions for the community? I, I guess we've got to ask him some questions. Okay. <laughs> um, so Jimmy, it is, it is refreshing to have a legislator <clears throat> who understands the budget process um, head up DBED. And <clears throat> I know during the budget um, deliberations or the budget briefings <clears throat> that you try to get the DBED staff, agent uh, department heads, um, <clears throat> attach agencies to to heed to some of the recommendations, and some of them did, but a lot of, a few of them, several of them didn't. So how are you getting them on board with the understanding of what's um, needed? I, okay, so I will say that um, few, um, have not, we have not totally connected yet. And part of it is my fault uh, because I was assigned to something else. Um, I think you can see from the people who showed up today that they trust and respect what we're doing. And that's all, you know, we try to do is, first of all, gain everybody's uh, respect.
respect and trust, and then they, they can help us move the needle forward. But if they don't respect you and they don't trust you, it's, it's not going to work. So for me personally, it's a big part of our management style that um, we get everybody to understand that, you know, we're just trying to make uh, DBED better. We're trying to make the state better. And the, the only way that, you know, in any management opportunity, the only way we can do that is by trust and respect. So that's well, what we're focused yeah, on. And I just want to state for the record that um, when Mr. Takeoka took over DBED as acting, invited some of us to come and speak to the staff to explain what the process is and how it can assist them when they come before us and answering questions and being prepared and so forth. So uh, I think that's the first time we, I've ever had in all my years had somebody, uh, a director, ask us to come in and address the, their um, department. So oh, yeah. I think that was a good step in the right direction. And certainly a lot of them got it, but there's always a few that takes them a while. <laughs> I th I'm not even going to look behind, but I think you can. Uh, we I appreciate we appreciate you coming because after uh, the, the legislators that came uh, when they left, everyone said, you know, that's absolutely true. I'm glad that she said that. I'm glad that he said that. So um, we still have uh, more uh, legislators that we want to come and be a part of the meeting because that's where we brainstorm ideas and that's where we try to get everybody on the same page. So if people are trying to stray off, then they know that. You know, like I have said before, we have 17 agencies at DBED, and you know we have to treat everybody fairly and equally, and as, again with respect. And so, I I, I know that uh, for you personally, when you came, everybody was uh, very um, appreciative of the things that you shared on when is it important to come talk story and not in the middle of conference when you got. 200 things that you're juggling, but you know, in the off session, if something is a long term plan, and I and I'm hoping that everybody's going to um, continue to heed that advice. Well, I think communication is a key and that's what you know is lacking up in Congress. And so for us to have it, I think, and have the leaders that will, um, you know, preach it and 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 do do the actually to do it. So thank you for that. Yeah, thank, thank you. Um, you know, I would just say that again, I go back to, you know, our experience, Deputy Director and I, we know what it's like to be on the other side and we know what you guys are thinking. So we want to make sure that we can anticipate some of these things so that <coughs> we don't get cracks at one of the meetings. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so I, I'm just going to finish up, um, you know, and I'm sure the rest of us echo the same sentiments that Senator Kim echoes. Um, I, I will tell you this, that I, um, and let the committee know I had the honor and privilege of working with you during the beginning of the fires and prior to that, when you kind of was sleeping at the house level. But, you know, I, I really appreciate, you know, the exchange of uh, information, um, the sharing that you've given to all of us as you headed as the interim director for DBED. Um, it has been nothing but communication back and forth with every one of them. I think it sets a, a precedent here with many of the other directors that have either been before us or those to come. So I, I like the fact that there's open and clear dialogue um, and that they've actually called to schedule actually better timing, like you said, not during conference. So I really appreciate that. I um, appreciate the fact of your vision and what you move forward and the people that surround you. And like I said, if um, the differences of opinions of, of people that you've worked with have now changed and have supported you, I, I thank the Lieutenant Governor for being here because I, I really was like, oh my God, here's an opposition. Here's an opposition. <laughs> but in that case, you know, I thank you for that because I do know that she had she was very um, proud to work side by side with you as I was. Um, and with that, before I get kicked out of here, I'm going to go to decision making. Um, and uh, we're ready to decision make on our 2 p.m. Energy Economic Development uh, GM agenda. GM 595 submitting for consideration and confirmation as a director of Department of Business, Economic Development, and Tourism, Governor Taro nominee James Konani Tokioka for a term to expire 12 31 2026. My recommendation is to advise and consent. Any discussion from the committee members? 
Seeing none, Chair Wakai for the vote. Chair votes aye. Vice Chair votes yes. Senator Fukunaga. Aye. Senator Kim. Aye. Senator Favela. Aye. Chair, your recommendation is adopted. Thank you and congratulations to our nominee. <laughs> With that, we can adjourn the hearing. Uh, mahalo for being here today. Adjourn. Uh, chair, you have.